of you that the enemy has tried to put on you this week. You get filled back up, but not just filled up. You need to be filled up to overflowing so you have something to offer whenever you leave this place. I want you to change maybe the way you think about coming to church. Even if you come here real heavy, going through some stuff, I want you to come here when, it, when it's heavy. I want you to come here expecting God to show up and uh, refill you, rejuvenate you. I want you to think about that. But I need you to add to that thought process that your relationship with God is way bigger than that. He doesn't want to just have you show up and Him heal you and Him fill you up and make you well. I always love to bring up that example, that guy that's paralyzed sitting by the water for 38 years. Been paralyzed for 38 years and every year he has somebody carry him to the waters because the first person in the water, once it's stirred, gets healed. 38 years he's had somebody take him every year. What were his chances of being the first one in the water if he's paralyzed? You think somebody that needs to be healed is going to give up their healing to put him in the water? But he went every year to, yeah, this is what he wanted, more than anything. He wanted to be healed, he wanted to be able to walk. And Jesus shows up. Y'all know he knows everything, right? Did y'all know that about Jesus, right? Y'all know that? Okay. In case you didn't know, or if you thought you was getting away from something, away with something, he knows. He kind of made you. And he kind of wrote a book about you before he ever created you, about everything that you would ever do. Good or bad, he wrote it down and chose to create you anyway because you bring him that much joy. And you have that much potential and he believes in you that much. He creates you anyway, no matter how you feel. I almost said I don't care how you feel, but I mean I do. I'm not that cold. <laughs> I don't care how you feel. <laughs> I don't care why you came. I do. I do care how you feel, but I don't care how you feel in regards to what the truth of what the word says. You feel like you don't have potential? Okay. You can keep telling yourself that for the next 40, 50 years and do nothing with your life or with your salvation. Or you can choose to defeat the lie with what the truth of what the word says. That you're fearfully and wonderfully made. That he knew you from the foundations of the earth. That he knew everything you would ever do, good and bad, and chose to create you anyway. And that you have a plan and a purpose and an expected end. And God won't stop once he starts with you until the day of your salvation. He won't stop until the day of Jesus Christ. That everything that Satan meant for evil, that he's going to turn around into good. Everything that makes you feel like a victim and everything that makes you feel like somebody did you wrong. God will turn into a story to bless somebody that you run into if you're willing to open your mouth and share it. Do you believe that today? Jesus asked that guy, he says, Jesus, knowing everything, walks up to this guy that's been paralyzed for 38 years and says, do you want to be made well? Jesus knows everything. And he's talking to a man that's been paralyzed for 38 years and has the nerve to ask, do you want to be made well? So Jesus is either going somewhere or he just asked the dumbest question that he's ever asked in his life. You know everything and you're going to ask a paralyzed man, are you tired of it? <laughs> and obviously Jesus is no dummy, right? So he must have been going somewhere with it. He didn't ask him, hey, do you want to be healed today? Hey, do you want me to take care of that physical stuff that you've been complaining about all your life? Jesus was asking something way deeper than anything physical. Can he take care of the physical? Like Cass said earlier, that's an easy thing. Just speak and he's healed. Jesus was saying, Did you want to, do you want to be made well? Like that physical stuff, that's, that's easy. That's a no-brainer. But what about all that other junk in there? All that stuff in your heart, the bitterness of 
sitting there for 38 years waiting to get in the water. The unforgiveness of watching your friends bring you to the water with a little bit of hope that we might put you in. But when the water stirs, they're the first ones in. Because we know that's how friends are, right? How about that stuff? Because that's the stuff that prison is made of. Healing is easy. But healing doesn't set anybody free. Jesus heals ten lepers. Nine of them burn off to never come tell him thank you. One of them gets far away and then he has the thought, oh my gosh, I've had leprosy. I couldn't even be in my own hometown. Not only did I have to stay outside of my town, but I had to stay at the dump and wait for leftovers to drift through sewage to get to me so I have something to eat. And if, if I ever pass by a clean person, if I'm not ashamed and embarrassed enough, I had to scream that I was unclean so they didn't come near me. And a man named Jesus shows up and heals you. And nine of them burn off. It's easy to point the finger at them and be like, man, those ungrateful suckers. But we do it all the time. It's crazy because sometimes we'll spend days in prayer, years in prayer before something manifests. And then when it happens, we forget that we even spent that much time praying. And don't turn back around and say, man, God, you're pretty cool. <laughs> you're pretty awesome. Thank you for that. Because sometimes those long prayers and that time at the altar, you think God doesn't see your tears, you think he doesn't see your hurt, you think he doesn't see your pain. You don't miss nothing. You don't miss nothing. So you come to church today, I guess my question is to you, would you like God to heal you today? Or would you like God to make you well? That's not one of the choices. Do you want to be healed? Or do you want to be made well? Because for your life to be full of joy, full of peace, the fruits of the Spirit and all that, at some point, we have to ask God, will you make me, hit? Will you make me whole? I'm really kind of tired of all this mess. And then you go another step further, because the Bible says once you're saved, why are you even here for? You're here to bring Him glory, right? How do you bring Him glory? What's one example of how you show His glory, right? How you affect other people. That's really what it's all about. After you get saved, from that point on, Life is really about making life better for other people. And we make that so complicated when sometimes it's simply as easy as sitting with them, not saying a word, and letting them talk. Sometimes I've been blown away like I know a whole lot of stuff. I've had a few years to read, right? Y'all that don't know me, I was locked up for 11 years. So I had time to read. I know a lot of good stuff. I know a lot of helpful stuff. And some of the most profound compliments I ever had is when I didn't say a word and I just shut my hole long enough to let them get it out. So people that think they're not called to speak or sing or preach and all that good stuff, I don't really have anything to offer because you see these gifts. There's nowhere in the Bible that says this is more important than the gift of intercessory prayer. Nowhere in the Bible does it list an order of these are the ones you should go after right here. No matter of fact, it narrows it down to one. If you're going to seek something, seek love. Everybody likes the gift of tongues because it's showy and you get to show out and it turns into a show. You don't know if it's real or if it's not because it gets so crazy sometimes. Everybody wants to seek that one because it's a showy gift. He must be super saved talking like that. Super saved, comes with a cake. God says, man, don't seek that stuff. Doesn't mean anything anyway. It just sounds like brass symbols if he doesn't love. So seek love. Can you do that? No matter where you are, no matter what you think your gifts are, if you don't have a clue what your gifts are, can you love? Can you start loving today? And love can sometimes just be in the form of sitting with somebody, letting them talk. In Hebrew, they have this, uh, they have a ceremony called uh, sitting Shiva, is what it's called. So you have somebody that passes away, right? My job as your friend is to come to your house and sit with you and not say a word. 
I want to ask you how you're doing. I want to ask you all the dumb questions we asked. How you doing? How you feeling? You're going to be okay. We just show up and we sit down with you and we be quiet to let you know we're there. Is there anybody who doesn't know what their gifts are that's not capable of doing that? If you can't do that, do we have an excuse for not doing something? And maybe we need to pray that we have the desire to do something. Maybe, maybe life and Satan has beat you up so bad you have no desire to help somebody else. But if you ever get to sit with somebody and make the smallest impact on somebody's life, it'll start a fire in you that you just don't even, you can't even comprehend. There's something very powerful about knowing that God at any given moment can snap his fingers and heal everybody and save everybody, but chooses not to and chooses to send people like you. There's something very exciting about that, like God of heaven chose me and you to go be a blessing to somebody when he could do it all on his own. Is that cool to you or am I crazy? Isn't that, is that kind of cool? Mm -hmm. Because you're sitting here while I'm talking about all this cool God stuff thinking, but he doesn't know this. And he doesn't know that I did that. And he doesn't know that I struggle with this. And he doesn't know that I struggle with that. And I'm not perfect. I just started this church thing. I've been doing this church thing for 50 years and I've never led anybody to Christ. So obviously I'm not a real Christian. We beat them. You beat me? So you're sitting there giving yourself all the reasons on why God wouldn't use you. While I'm sitting here telling you if you're breathing, God's purpose for you was to use you. So can you find a little bit of excitement in that? That God of heaven wants to use you to touch somebody. That's a cool thing to me. I don't take that lightly. Not that it's a competition, but people that I get to touch, he could have he used you to do it. The people that he chooses you to go touch, he could use me if he wanted to. But for whatever reason, those people he sends you to them. And certain people he sends me to them. And I think that's pretty cool that God would see enough in us to send us to go change somebody's life. I think that's kind of cool that God would do that. So this song, I'm gonna ask you to do something weird. Y'all cool with that? Say yes, because we're doing it anyway. Say yes, yes, all right. So if I ask you to do something uncomfortable, nobody leave, y'all lock the back doors. If I ask you to do something semi, some of you won't be uncomfortable at all. You're, you're cool with it, you already do it. Some of you, it's gonna be very awkward. But if this was an opportunity for growth for you and your spiritual walk, if it was an opportunity for growth to get you just slightly outside your comfort zone so it wouldn't be so weird when you meet a stranger and God tells you to go, are you willing to do it right here with your church family? It's good practice right here. It's safe in here. Everybody willing to do that? You don't even know what I'm going to ask. Everybody, don't do it because I say so. I mean, I'll pick on you if you don't, but don't do it because I say so. Do it because it really is an opportunity for you to impact somebody's life and you're giving somebody else an opportunity to change your life. I want you to go face to face, everybody. If you're with your spouse, that don't count. If your best friend is in the room, if your best friend's in the room, it don't count. I want you to go find somebody you either don't know that well, don't know at all, or don't get to talk to every week. I want you to go to them right now and stand face to face. Pretend like it's not awkward. Just pretend. Pretend it's not awkward. Go find somebody. Don't make it a spouse. Don't make it a, your kid. Preferably somebody you don't know. Come on, Leroy. You ain't, don't be shy. Go. If there's an odd number, we'll put three on them. not have somebody there's three back there they can y'all can stay with each other and here's all I want you to do I want you to take a minute to two minutes I don't care if it goes longer than that this isn't my show but I want you to spend the next couple of minutes I don't even want you to ask them what they're going through that's not important I just want you to start praying for that person in front of you like you were praying for your mom or if you were praying with your kid that was dying of cancer that type of passion just pray for them. Don't pick your words. Don't try to make it pretty. Don't try to make it churchy. Just pray. And somebody say, hey, I'm not used to praying out loud. That's fine. The person in front of you does not know if you're a professional prayer or not. They have no idea. Is that what you're going through, sister? You're laughing. 
They don't care if you're a professional prayer or not. Just let it come from the heart, okay? So spend a minute to two minutes and just pour them, bless them. Just ask God to bless them. Easy stuff. But don't worry about your words. Try not to even think about your words. Spend a minute or two praying for them. Let them turn around and do the same for you. And y'all can go. And we're going to sing Heart of Worship.
Amen. Wasn't that beautiful? Pretty much. What y'all doing crying in church? Thought y'all could. What happened? It happens what? It doesn't happen often? I tell you what, I'm, I was going to say I'm hoping that you were blessed by it, but I don't have to because I saw what happened. I saw what happened. Isn't it amazing how easy ministry is? As uncomfortable as it might have been, the, probably the most uncomfortable part was moving, right? Like, go, like I saw you, sister. I saw you, man. <laughs> she, she's looking at him like, man, I really got to go. Go take up for me. Go hit that dude. Were you blessed by it, sister, whoever you prayed with? And who blessed you? Yeah? Good. Anybody get blessed by that? Like for real, for real? I saw a lot of tears. I saw a lot of hugging too. Y'all some friendly folks, man. That's good, man. So now it ain't so bad, right? Not so hard getting out of your comfort zone, just praying for people. Could you do that? I'm not saying add it to the routine of church because it could quickly become routine like everything else. But could you do that every once in a while without somebody at church saying, let's stop and pray for each other? Could you do that before we start the first song? Go find somebody and be like, hey, let's go spend a couple minutes in the corner. Just want to pray for you. Does that seem like such a big deal to do now after that? And I'm telling you, man, it will change somebody's day. It will change their week. And it might change their life. Something that easy. Pretty crazy. Lord God, I just think you're awesome. I know you're awesome. And I thank you for meeting here, meeting us here already, Lord God. Thank you for your, your presence in this place, your spirit in this place. Thank you for the beautiful music today. Man, worship was just awesome. So thank you for everybody involved in that. I know there's so much work that goes behind the scenes, uh, preparing and practicing. People on the sound team, Lord God, I just thank you for their hearts to do ministry, Lord God. And uh, but Lord, we just, we're thankful that you showed up. We're thankful that you meet us here. That you would allow us to worship you. I think that's pretty cool. Lord, I just pray that you be with us as we go into the Word. Just take over my, my thoughts, Lord, and my words. Let me say what you want to say. And I pray for the hearts that we wouldn't be distracted that uh, Satan, he's probably far, far from here by now. He can't handle all this type of stuff. So he's not welcome here. And we're thankful that he's out of this place. And he's not here to distract us. So I just pray for our hearts that it would receive the Word in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God is good, right? Man, he's good, man, every time. He's faithful. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses, uh, probably starting 16 somewhere. Not a verse that you don't know. Second Corinthians 5, I'm going to start in 16 and just read for, until I feel like stopping. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him, thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, is anybody in here in Christ? Anybody? A bunch of you, I know you're saved and you're not raising your hands. But Roy, what's wrong with you? I got to call you up here? Thank you. All right. Raise your hand. All right. If anybody is in Christ, he is a new creation. This word is only used that I know of, that I've found so far, so don't quote me on this. This word is only used three times in the Bible that I know of. Creation. In the beginning, God, four times, I just lied to you at church, oh my God, I'm done. So it's only used four times that I know of. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word, if you look it up in Hebrew, will say Bereshit is the name. And it's a very important word. Uh, it actually goes as deep into like a circumcision and stuff like that, if you know anything about that type of covenant. But what the word means is a brand new cut. It also means, we talked about it once before, one of the times that I was here before. It also means that you don't just take something, clean it up, change it, whatever, and make something else out of it. The word means to take nothing and create something out of it. Can y'all do that? <laughs> Here's some nothing. Here's some nothing. Go do something with it. Yeah. Here's some nothing. When you're going through all those scriptures and, uh, and he made man in his likeness and he made this, but then it says he created the heavens and the earth. There was nothing there to work with. So God took that nothing and turned it into heavens and the earth. 
Then he creates, the only time you'll see it in, in Genesis again is when he gets over to the sea life. He has to create again out of nothing. Let me tell you why. So he creates heaven and earth. There's nothing there. He takes nothing and boom, creates heaven and the earth. Creates something out of nothing. Then he gets on down and he makes plants. He makes mankind. Makes foundations. Why does he go from create to make? Because make changes. It means you take pre-existing materials and make something else out of it. When he created the heavens and the earth, there was nothing to work with. And boom, he creates heaven and earth. Now he's got heaven and earth. He's got some sand. What was man made out of? Dust of the earth. So he makes mankind because now he's using some material that exists, just changing the form of it. When you get over to the fish, they're not made out of sand. So we've got to create again something out of nothing. It's a brand new thing. Then you jump over to Psalm 51, I believe it is, where, God, where David's screaming out, God, create in me a clean heart. He was telling God, don't take my heart and clean it up and wash it up and give it back to me. Hey, I'm tired of this one. I've jacked it up. There's no hope for it. I just want you to take it out and put something brand new. There's a reason why he uses that word create. Here we are again in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Did God just take your sinful self and turn you into something useful? What he did was actually deeper than that. You became something brand new. The part of you that's saved. Are you having problems back there, Jason? We need to put her in time out or what? You good? I'm just kidding. <laughs> you would admit it anyway, man. The part of you that is saved is something that is brand new that did not exist in there before. The Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit. So he didn't just take you. Here's where the confusion comes as a human being. We get saved, but we're still dealing with some crazy thoughts that we have. We're still dealing with disappointment. We're still dealing with rejection. Well, this salvation thing must not be very strong if I'm still dealing with the same stuff before I got saved. Your brain did not get saved. Make that very clear. Your brain did not get saved. Your schemes that Satan has been beating you to death with all your life, they did not get saved. Your tongue and your mouth did not get saved. Your attitude should have, but it didn't. Your temper did not get saved. Your craziness did not get saved. Your soul got saved. That's something brand new. And now that's something brand new. has to start working on all that crazy old. So it's like getting saved from the inside out. Salvation, everything that needs to happen in salvation, I don't care what theology you come from, what church you went to, what seminary you graduated from, we can fight this out whenever you want to. Whenever you get ready, we'll talk about it. But everything that needs to happen for salvation happens in that moment that you ask Jesus to come and live in your heart. And I do not care how you feel about that. Because it's what the scriptures teach. The moment. Everything that's ever needed and necessary for salvation happens in that moment. And the confusion comes because you spend the next, or at least the first couple of years, you know, the first couple of weeks you know you're saved, you're super saved, you feel like you can fly, you want to tell everybody about Jesus until you get rejected the first time, then you're like, maybe I'm not saved, I don't really know what I'm talking about. Maybe I should have read the Bible before I went and talked to that one. Then you start doubting. And then you start struggling with some old junk. You don't struggle with it at first because you're so in love and mesmerized by this whole thing about, man, God really touched me at the altar. I, I can't even explain it. But something is different. Y'all remember that? Something is different. And then the honeymoon thing is over after it's different for everybody, you know, a day. Or sometimes weeks, months, years, whatever. But then all of a sudden, now we've got to start dealing with our junk. It starts coming back. If you're not learning the scriptures or if you're not in the word yourself, Satan's going to start playing on that to make you doubt your salvation. If you were really saved, you wouldn't struggle with that anymore. If you were really saved, you wouldn't still feel like a disappointment. If you were really saved, you wouldn't get angry. If you were really saved, that cuss word would not have came out of your mouth. Boy, I hope that's not true. Hammers can do wonders on your religion. 
when they hit the end of your thumb. Or you kick your toe in the middle of the night. And it's 30 degrees when you do it. What? Oh, I thought you cussed. I'm just kidding. You're not saved, brother. I'm just kidding. Do you understand what I'm saying? Everything that needs to happen in salvation happens in the moment that you accept Christ. Salvation is done and complete. What happens from that day until your last breath is called sanctification. A process of being set apart. A process of being different than everybody else around you that's not saved. Sanctification. You are not sanctified the day that you get saved. You just got started. Now we got a mess to clean up. How does that happen? Reading the scripture. Fighting lies with truth. Talk to a kid. Uh, what day did I go? Talk to that kid. Friday. Uh, Okay, I've got to tell you a story. You know I'm full of stories, right? Preachers always got full. Of stories. I always wondered when I sit out there and I didn't want to be a preacher, and I heard the preachers telling a thousand stories. Like, where do they get these stories from, and how do they remember them? Like they're in the middle of preaching, and this long freaking story comes out. Like, do they memorize all of them? And then I realize once you're up here, your memory it just starts coming back. Like you hadn't thought about something in years, and boom, God just—it's funny. So if y'all were ever wondering that about why we have so many stories, they just come out of nowhere. And we make some of them up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I'm on my way to prison a Friday ago. Yeah, a week ago Friday. I'm on my way to uh, San Antonio. Got a late start because I took a trailer down there with me to deliver to somebody that was on my way. Anyway, it's not even important in the story. So I'm driving. It's 11 o'clock. Yeah, that's another bad problem we have. We'll rabbit trail bad when we get to the stores. Focus. So I'm driving to the prison. It's 11 o'clock at night. And a friend that we go to church with in Grand Saline is texting and says, hey, can I call you? We got a, we got a problem. Like, of course, I'm going to call. So I call and she says, uh, I need you to talk to my brother because my brother really believes that his 15-year-old son is demon-possessed. There's some crazy stuff going on in this house and with this boy. And, was, and I knew then. I knew then. I'm talking about, you know, the tingles you get during worship? Well, it works the same way with the evil stuff. You, okay, but it, it's God letting you know, hey, get ready. Fix and go to war, right? So I knew at that moment I was going to make this kid. I just knew. I knew, I knew, I knew. And so after she drops this heavy bomb on me, like we're dealing with a demon possessed 15 year old boy. But you can wait till tomorrow to text him if you want to. What? You just dropped an A bomb on me and told me you can take care of it later. I was like, no, give me his number so I can call him now. So they send me the number to his brother. So I'm fixing to talk to the dad. Okay? Now ride with me, fellas. Because I ain't fixing to say this to beat you up. I don't want you to leave beat up. I want you to know the state of men in our church. This is the most clear picture that I think I've ever seen of a lot of Christian men. So I call the guy. His name is... I'm not going to say his name. It's recording. Um, <laughs> so I call him. We'll call him Howard. No, no. Um, so I called Howard, and uh, I swear I'm retarded, man. I don't know what happened. I'm not all the way sanctified yet. So I call this guy, and I was like, hey, my name is Jason. I'm friends with your sister. She told me that you know, we're having some issues with your 15-year-old son, uh, maybe demon-possessed. Like, how do you have that conversation when he hadn't offered that information? Like, oh, it's, Yeah, yeah, we're having trouble. This is bad. I was like, okay. I said, all right. Tell me about it. Let's talk about it. He goes, hold on. Let me put you on the phone with my wife. Excuse me. <laughs> Nothing against women. Y'all know, man, they're strong, strong women Christians. I love Christian women. I think they're amazing. I don't think I'd be alive or preaching if it wasn't for Christian women. Great grandmother started all this mess. Y'all blame her when we get there. Nothing against women, nothing against godly women. But I'm talking to a man on the phone about his son that is possibly demon-possessed, suicidal, telling his mother he wants to kill her. And then five minutes later, he's fine. And it's all good. I'm talking to the father of this 15-year-old boy. And after hello, he says, let me put you on the phone with my wife. 
And so after I asked him, excuse me a couple more times, why would I talk to her about your son? Well, she knows more about it. You don't live there? What do you mean she knows more about it? Well, she can explain it better. She, she knows more about it. So by this time, I'm mad. I, I'm worried about the boy. So I'm like, okay, put her on the phone. But that has not left my mind since I talked to him a week ago. I can't get that out of my head. I'm talking to a man that goes to church about his 15-year-old boy that is possibly demon-possessed and threatening to kill his mom and this guy's wife. And his first reaction is, let me put my wife on the phone. There's already a problem in that house before we ever deal with the demon-possessed boy. Anyway. So I talked to her for like 30, 40 minutes of the drive. She gives me the lowdown. So I come back home, talk to the dad a few more times. I don't talk to her anymore. I was like, me and you have to talk. We have to talk about this. So I talked to him. He'll talk a little bit. Then he'd have to go. He'd tell me to text. We'd set up a date. Then... Um, he wouldn't text back. So then we set up a date for what I think it was Tuesday. I was supposed to go Tuesday. So then I texted him. I said, I need directions to your house for when I get off work. I'll go out there. Doesn't respond all day long. We already agreed on Tuesday. When I asked for directions, he doesn't message back. So I'm like, are you kidding me? So Wednesday comes and goes. Thursday, he goes, hey, man, I think I missed your text the other day. Uh, we need to get back on the phone and decide what we're going to do. And I was like, yeah, yeah. Can you call me right now? So we, we call right now. I was like, I need you to text me directions to your house. I can't get to your house. I don't know where you live. You've got to give me that information. Okay, I'll get that to you. And Dunn messages me back on Thursday. So now it's Friday. It's about 4 o'clock, 4.30, something like that. Getting ready about 30 minutes or so to leave and go home. And he calls. Hey, do you want to take care of that in the next couple of weeks? When I get there, I'm going to slap you so hard, so freaking hard. Just knock a tooth out of the side of your head when I get there. No. I want to do it as early as we can. Can we do it today? Let me ask my wife. Do it. Ask her. So we get it set up. We can do it that night at 7 o'clock. Okay, I'll be there at 7 o'clock. Get the address. I get the directions. I was like, hey, I need directions. He's like, it's hard to get to. I was like, where can I meet you at? So we, we met at a grocery store and I followed him there. So anyway, I go to his house and I, I knew when I got there something was wrong. Like I'm not saying like I was thinking of, yeah, like that. <laughs> he did that right there when I pulled in. Started lightning. No, I'm just kidding. That was freaky. <laughs> freaky. <laughs> he followed me here. <clears throat> wow. Wow. Crazy. So when I got to the house, I knew something was up. So they're dealing with a whole other issue when I get there. One of the kids is missing. One of the daughters is missing. When I pull in, there's cars everywhere. I'm like, oh, wow, we're having a pepper alley to get rid of this thing. So uh, nobody knows where the daughter's at. So I'm like, man, this is just going to be in my, my mind. I'm like, chaos. Satan is all about chaos. We're distracting right now. So I find out what the deal is. We start, let's pray for her first. Let's find out, make sure she's safe and taken care of and all that. So we pray about all that. And uh, told them, hey, y'all do whatever y'all need to do. I'd really like to talk to the, uh, the son. I'd really like to talk to everybody. Well, they figured out, they finally get somebody on the phone that knows, knows where she's at. So we go in the house and we sit there. I kid you not. And I ain't trying to be all weird or, you know, poltergeisty or nothing like that. As soon as I got my first steps in there, the lights go to flicker. Don't mean crap to me. It's a lot. You know what I'm saying? Like, if, really? That's how you're going to scare me off? Well, I've seen all the movies. I've seen Poltergeist. You can't scare me. I saw it. That was pretty weird stuff. After watching that, this is nothing. And I'm being humorous about it, but really, that's what happened. Howard, when I walked in the door, the lights went to flicker, and I'm like, oh, this is the real deal. <laughs> okay, where's my gun at? I don't even have one. <laughs> so the lights go to flicker. And when the lights flickered, my mind went straight to that boy, and I turned around to look at him, and he's looking at me. And I said, is this what happens right here? He goes, yeah, that's how it starts. The boy said that. Because I know he knows. I mean, he knows what's going on. It's either whatever you want to call it. I can't correctly label it because I'm not that boy. I couldn't tell you if he's possessed, oppressed, influenced. I don't know. But I knew enough to know from the phone call on the way to San Antonio 
that Satan was in that house. I'm talking about I was buzzing like crazy. When I got on that property, I knew when I walked in that house, I felt it. I felt it. Again, I'm not going to tell you whether he was possessed or not. Only this kid can probably tell you in God. But Satan was definitely at work in this place. But I know he knows whenever he's under the influence or not. And I can't explain it because it happened so fast in that moment. But I knew once those lights flickered, I knew, I knew to go to him. I don't know how I knew. I just knew. And I asked him, is this how it starts? And he said, yes, this is how it starts. So he's aware when it's coming on. Very aware. Very bright kid. Football player. And it's just like what you would think. You can see the dark in his eyes and all that. You can see there's not hardly any light in him. So anyway, we're in the house and we sit down. And uh, so mom and dad are there. And so I'm like, okay. This, <laughs> whenever we sit down, he goes, is this my talker? Like that's how he explained me. You know, the guy coming to talk to him. So I knew that was going to make him feel awkward off the bat. I'm the talker that showed up. So I said, yeah, I'm the talker. I said, uh, let me tell you a little bit about me so it doesn't make it so awkward whenever we get to you. So you all know what I shared. I shared my, my story with him, and I talked about friends and this and that. And then God wouldn't let me get off this disappointment thing I shared with you all that I went through, you know, feeling like a disappointment because of what happened to me. And then finally, after getting saved and reading Scripture, reading that verse, Psalms 139, 16, God knew everything you would ever do before you did it, before you lived one day, and he recorded it in his book. How can you be a disappointment that knows everything you're ever going to do and creates you anyway? You cannot. So I went into that, and it was really hard for me to get off of that topic. And, of course, when I get done, that's one of his first responses. That's what I struggle with. So mom is in another town. Mom doesn't want him. His real mom. Stepdad beats him, slaps him around. Whenever he says something they don't like, they just slap him, slap him, slap him, slap him. So a year ago, he moves to the house that he's at now. So that was life growing up, just getting slapped around by the stepdad, made fun of, mom that doesn't care one way about you one way or the other. So that was his version of love, right? So he comes to this new house, and he's got a stepmom that loves Jesus, but doesn't really know what to do, right? So she's doing her thing, though. She's praying and anointing everything, and then her husband is also saved and doesn't know what to do. So the first thing he tells me about is, that's what I deal with. I feel like a disappointment. I said, okay, let's start there. And I won't harp on this story too long. The point of where I'm going is, before I finish the story, what we did today, praying for each other, that's ministry. That was ministry right there. If you ever get the call from your friend, especially you ladies, where your homegirl's your absolute best friend, and she calls you because her husband doesn't know what to do, and your husband doesn't know what to do, hey, I've got a 13-year-old, a 14-year-old, a 15-year-old that might be possessed, if not possessed, crazy, crazy angry. Can you come over here and go to war with me? You're either going to have to say no because you have no experience. I'm not a demon chaser. That's not what I do. I didn't sign up for that. You know what I mean? But when you get the call, what do you do? What do you say? You go. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't have anything to do with my experience. If I know what to say, if I know the right words, if I know the right particular... All I knew in my head when I got the phone call was, was he that is in me, he that is in me is greater than he that's in the world. Right? And the same guy that saved me cares about that 15-year-old boy. And somebody's got to show up and tell him. If demons come out and go crazy and throw stuff around the house or whatever, that's just going to happen. At the end of the day, God is bigger than that. And at the end of the day, God is more powerful than that. You throw one more plate and I'm going to cast you back into hell. That was my mentality. Throw a plate if you want to. Like I could take it easy on you and cast you out of the house. You keep on playing, we'll just cast you all the way back to hell. How about that? And I'm not even playing when I say that. God gives you the authority and the power with your mouth if we don't want to believe it. I don't like talking about demons just a whole lot because I don't know a lot about it. And I'm not a demon chaser. But I got the phone call. So you either say no because you have no experience or you show up expecting, hey God, I'm going in there. Don't make me look stupid. You better show up. Because that's what I'm going to tell them. I'm going to tell them I came because God's going to show up. So don't make me look dumb. You show up. That's how I felt about prison ministry. That's how I felt the first time we went. I didn't even want to go do the homeless stuff. Remember, Roy, when we first started doing that? I didn't even want to go. Then I found out a whole bunch of stiff, strong Christian women were going by themselves. I'm like, no guys are going? We're going to send all of our ladies under the bridge with no guys because the guys don't want to go. It's football. I like football too, but you're sending all your women under the bridge. 
Somebody's got to go. So I just show up and fell in love with it. You don't, you don't have to have experience to show up. You're taking God everywhere you go. And everywhere you go, you're going to run into broken people. So if you can simplify ministry and faith and religion and scripture and my calling and my gifts and all that mess, we spend so much time trying to figure out what's my gift, what's my calling. I don't know, so I'm going to do nothing. I don't know my gift or talent, so I'm going to do nothing. No, go to Walmart and take God with you and see what happens. One of the most favorite things that I do still today is when I go to Walmart. It doesn't happen every single time, but it's happened a lot now that I look for it. One time I was coming out of Walmart and I saw this older lady, small older lady, and she is fighting this 50 pound bag of dog food. And I'm looking around, there's guys just walking by. Big guys, I'm like, for real? So I run over, there, run over there real quick and say, hey, can I put that in the back of your car? Oh, are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> dog food. I grab the dog food, put it in the back of the car, and I'm talking about smile big as day, million dollar smile. Thank you so much. Da, 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 da. When I go to Walmart now, I spend about 30 extra seconds before I walk in scoping the parking lot. It probably looks like I'm stalking, but I'm not. <laughs> now that I think about it, I'm probably going to jail. But I'm looking to see if that situation has happened. And it doesn't happen every time, but I'm telling you, I've probably loaded 10 bags of dog food in the last six months or so for people. Something small. You know what I mean? Ministry is not very hard, man. Everywhere you go, you're running into broken people. And you don't have to show up on the street corner preaching the gospel to make everybody mad. You just, God is going to let you run into people on purpose. I guess what it comes down for me is are you looking for it? Let's get to this. Y'all got me sidetracked. Therefore, is anyone, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away, thank God. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God. Here's what I want to talk about. Who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. I don't know my gifts. I don't know my talents. Who did that apply to, Howard? Huh? Everybody. I'm sorry that I ruined your Christian walk today, but you have a gift now. You have to do something with it. I just ruined everything. You can't just sit here anymore and do nothing. I'm sorry. I know I'm not. I lie a lot from up here. I'll get saved one day. God has given you the gift of reconciliation. What is that? He created them. We are lost. And God sends people to bring them back to him. The cool thing is, is that he does all the hard work. One, he died on the cross. You don't have to. So don't go be a martyr everywhere you go. You should have seen me before Jesus. You don't know how bad it was. Well, it still looks bad when you talk like that. You're not offering nothing I want. You're a martyr and Jesus is the one who died for you. Thank God he did that because I don't want to do that. Not only did he die on the cross, so he's already made the payment. So nobody's got to earn their way or earn their keep. And then on top of that, the scripture goes as far as to say is no man even come to the Father until Jesus starts drawing him to himself anyway. So you're not out there trying to force Jesus on anybody. You're just out there looking for the ones that God's already pulling on. How do you find them? God makes you bump into them. If they're in your life and they are around you and you just happen to have the strangest unplanned conversation at Walmart, guess what's going on? So I go to Florida because people hear my story and they're like, you need to write a book, you need to write a book, you need to write a book. Finally, I heard enough people say that, I decided I need to get serious about that and write a book. Because I feel like that's going to bless a lot of people one day. I went to Florida to a non-Christian event to focus for four days about writing my book. That was my plan. <laughs> and God jacked it up. The only thing I did right before the trip, I had no experience traveling, flying. It was my first flight, first everything, right? Yeah, that came back to bite me too. So, um, I'm not planning for the trip, but I had enough 
sensitivity to the spirit when it came time to get the plane tickets to where the lady on the phone, I didn't even know you could pick your, your seats. I didn't know that was an option. So like, where do you want to sit? I'm like, on the plane. <laughs> Don't put me on the top, you know what I mean? No wing seat, nothing like that, just in it. Put me in it, start to finish. Like, no, where do you want to sit? And the front? I mean, <laughs> no, there's numbers. You can pull it up online and pick the seat number. I'm like, oh, okay, okay, cool. Well, I was like, I really don't know. They're like, well, you need to pick, because if you don't pick, you're going to end up in the middle between two big dudes. I'm like, and then I had this thought. I'm like, you know what? I don't want to pick. I said, I don't want to pick. Just put me wherever. And I'm already God thinking now. I'm like, all right, I'm going to see what God wants to do. They're like, no, you need to pick. I'm like, I don't want to pick. You just pick. Put me anywhere. They're like, are you sure? I'm sure. And then she won't let it go. Because it's a God moment, right? It's not even about picking seats. And she won't leave it alone. I'm like, just pick the seats. I don't want to pick the seats. And she's like, why? Everybody picks their seats. Because I think God's going to put me where he wants me. Oh. Yeah. Oh, exactly. You made me say it. So just put me wherever. I'm going to believe God's going to put me where he needs me, where he wants me. Because he don't need me, but you know what I'm saying. So we get on the flight. Do the flight, it's, you know, this lady's trying to give me a heads up. She's like, oh, it's your first flight. I'm like, yeah. She's like, oh, man, just here's how I keep from getting nervous. When you're going down the runway and it's faster, 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 you just act like it's Six Flags and keep telling yourself, faster, faster, faster. I'm like, woman, if you see me at Six Flags, I'll scare everybody on the plane. <laughs> woo Going down the runway, you know, I'm going to give everybody a heart attack. We're going to pull the little air mask out and put on her. You don't want me pretending Six Flags on the plane. I'll get kicked off. So I didn't listen to that. I wanted to. It crossed my mind. I was like, that was good though. So uh, I got a middle seat between two big guys. <laughs> big guys. I said, I should have picked my seat. She tried to tell me to pick my seat. So I'm like, like this, like for real, like this. And the big guy to my right, he's really trying. He's like, hey, I'm going to lean into the window so you have some room. He's still all over me. And so the other guy, he's got nowhere to go, so he's all over me too. And I'm like, well, we might as well get acquainted, you know what I'm saying? We're going to be here a while. So I know at this point, I'm like, in my own head, I know how people are and I know how we think. If they ask me anything, it's going to lead to prison. There's no way to start a conversation with me on this plane, and I don't end up telling you I was in prison. So where are you going? I'm going to Florida. What for? I'm going to write a book. What are you going to write a book about? Hmm. So I'm thinking about this while I'm waiting to get on the plane. I already know. I was like, oh, man, how am I going to tell these strangers and not scare the crap out of them? So then I'm like, okay, what's another scenario? And they're like, uh, oh, how you doing? Is this your first flight? Yeah, this is my first flight. How old are you? I'm 37. You're 37 at your first flight? Yeah, how come? <laughs> I missed 11 years. I was 21. There's no way to start a conversation with me where we're not going to land in prison. So I get on the plane, I'm like, well, maybe God will give me grace and we can just talk about crap for an hour or two and I can say it right before we get off. So we sit down and the big guy that's trying to do me a favor in the window, he's like, where are you from? I was like, oh, crap. I was going for the awkward thing, like maybe we could just eat peanuts and stuff for a while. But as soon as we sit down, where are you from? I'm from Grand Saline. Oh, that's cool. What are you doing? Why? Going to Florida. Oh, cool. I'm going to Florida too. Great. Leave me alone. He's like, what are you doing in Florida? I was like, I'm going to a book writing seminar. I was like, oh, that's awesome. Your first book or are you already an author? And I said, no, it'll be my first book. Cool. What are you going to write about? My story. <laughs> so what's so important about your story that you need to write about it? And I'm like, good grief. Let's just do it and get it over with. And I was like, are you ready? Because we got two more hours, man, and it's pretty deep. And he goes, he goes, yeah, I'm ready. I was like, no, I'm for real. It's going to get deep, and you ain't got nowhere to go. <laughs> He's like, he goes, no, I want to know. I'm like, okay, cool. I said, well, this is my first flight. That was stupid. Don't say that out loud. Because now the people over to the side of us are like, this is your first flight? <laughs> yeah, it's my first flight. How old are you? I'm 37. And this is your first flight? You catch on quick. My first flight. Why is this your first flight? 
Everybody just listen in. We'll just get this over with in one walk. So I kid you not, I got five rows in front of me and five rows behind me turn around. And here we go. Well, it's my first flight because when I was 21, I was hanging out with the wrong guys and I went to prison for 11 years. I came home six years ago. I mean, I've been home for, yeah, I've been home for six years. And so now some of them try to turn back around normal. And not like we weren't talking about anything serious. And so then as fast as I can, I go into it was the best thing that ever happened to me because God saved me while I was in prison and I started preaching while I was in prison and now I'm out. I go back and do prison ministry and we do this and we do that. And God is awesome. Do you know God? By the end of it, everybody's like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. You have an amazing story. Can I get your information? When you write the book, I want the book. So before I even get off the plane, we got phone numbers. Everybody's trading phone numbers and you got all these strangers. Right? So it was so cool though because when I'm telling the story and I got these two big guys on me that can't go anywhere and we get to the went to prison for murder case, all of a sudden I had all kinds of elbow room. Well, I got as, <laughs> got as far away from it. Dude was like almost hanging out the window. He was trying to get somewhere. So I went real quick into the God stuff so he didn't get all nervous and scared, right? So, and he's a big dude and he is off of me now. So uh, anyway, I get all the story out, and by the end of it, we're like best friends. He's like, hey, when, before you leave Florida, come down here. I have a condo here, this and that. I was like, I don't have time for all that. I got, I'll be busy, but I'll, you know, I'll keep up with you and let you know how life's going and all that. So we get to Florida. We go there. I know when we show up at the place, I know I'm going to be the only guy that's been from prison. Everybody else is going to be business people and authors, and they've written several books and whatever. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this like I did the last deal. I'm not going to wait till the last day to tell everybody who I am. I'm just going to sling it out there the first day, and they're going to have to deal with it. So we're doing our introductions, and people are going, people are going. And uh, so they're like, hey, Jay, you got to wear name tags, Jason. Uh, so tell us who you are, where you're from. And I was like, Whew. my story doesn't bother me. It's more about are you going to scare everybody else when you know you're the only one even close to that kind of story in the room? So I was like, uh, my, name, my name's Jason. Uh, when I was 21, I went to prison for 11 years, and I've been home for six years, and that's what I'm going to write about my story. I want to inspire people. And everybody says, okay. <laughs> you know, you know you can feel it in the room. So then you start cracking jokes and make everybody laugh and this and that. So they're going around the room and there's this uh, seven, seven, she, no, 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 she's 24. She looks like she's 12. So this 24-year-old, she stands up, she says her name, and she says a whole bunch of stuff what she wants to do. Wants to be an actress, wants to sing, wants to do this, all this stuff, but she's got no self-worth, no value, no nothing. All the men in her life have just dogged her. And, I'm, and then she says this phrase, she goes, man, I have a very shameful past that keeps me from doing any of this stuff. And I knew in that moment, I'm going to talk to this one before we get out of here. She said that phrase, disappointment, shame, guilt. Young, got a lot going for her, and just Satan is keeping her down. So I'm like, all right, boom. God, okay, I know what I'm here for. So we meet, I meet some people on my table. God, long story short, God is just moving out all four days that I'm there. Just crazy. God moment, God moment, God moment, God moment. Share my story, it's blessing different people. So I tell this girl, I'm like, hey, one day I'm gonna, we're going to do lunch. Because you never leave the island. You just travel in packs. So I'm like, we're going to do lunch. I want to talk to you. She goes, okay. So like 12 of us go to lunch together. She's there and her mom's there. So lean across the table. And I'm not perfect, so i got to share the, all the story, right? So uh, it's not like i got a halo or anything. So I'm talking to this girl. I'm like, so tell me about your life. What's going on? So she shares her aspirations, what she wants to do. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. What's keeping you from it? Oh, shares the, the story, right? I'm like, man. So when it starts getting deep and you can feel God's taking over the conversation, her mom leans forward and butts in. And they're immigrants here 30-something years ago, which is fine. I don't have nothing against that. But we're like having a serious God conversation. And she leans forward to tell me that where she came from, she got over here and Americans don't know how to do this and we don't know how to do that. And Trump, I don't even want to go there. And it just starts going off. I'm like, okay, we're not even talking about Trump. So I let her say her spiel because I'm being polite. And then I turn back to her and I'm like, okay, so anyway... So what you were saying about this, da, 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 and then here comes mom again. La, 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 la. So I let her do that for about four times before I just kind of lose it. And I was like, hey, I asked your daughter to lunch because I feel like I can give her something to make her better than the way that I found her. I really want to speak to her and speak some life to her and encourage her and all that. And you just keep on spewing poison every time we start going somewhere with it. So if you don't really like it here, nobody asked you to come, you can go back. And if you don't like Trump, you can write him a letter. I'm not going to go tell him for you. So you can go back to where you came from or you can stay here and enjoy it because you're successful, you're doing well, you're in our military, thank you very much, but I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't interrupt us anymore. I've got 45 minutes with your daughter, it might change your life. And I'm, not, and I'm not making the story prettier than what it was, it was a little harsher than that. And I'm not saying that was the right way to handle it, but I knew I had 45 minutes and I wanted that 45 minutes. So I finally asked her, can we go to a booth by ourselves? We went to a booth, 
Boom, I share my story with her. She cries through the whole end of the story. Last day is graduation. You get to stand up and say what your biggest takeaway was. She stands up. She goes, man, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put in for this. I'm going to put into that. One of the deals was is she's a big Harry Potter fan. And the predominant actor, the role that she wants to do is predominantly played by, played by a white person. Well, their Broadway is doing a version of it now to where it's open to any ethnicity. And she didn't want to put in because she didn't think she'd get it. And it was, the auditions were going to be the day, the, the night after we graduate. So I told her, just show up one time. If that's really in your heart, God's probably put that desire in you. I said, you need to go try it out. Just go show up. Just promise me that as a friend, that you'll do that for me. For our time that we share together, just go show up and audition. What's the worst they can say? No. You're getting the no now, not going. Just go. Okay, I promise you I'm going to go. She stands up on graduation day. She goes, man, I learned so much here. It's great. My biggest takeaway is my new big brother right there, Jason. What he poured into me. Isn't that cool? By the way, she got the part. Yes. Yeah. So she messaged me later that night, and she said, hey, I just want you to know I went and auditioned. And I said, oh, that's awesome. And it was like four days later or something, I get a text. Just want you to know I got the part. Thanks for pushing me to go. So now she's enrolled in college. She got that part. She's got four more roles doing other stuff. Blah, blah. I mean, just God just boom, you know, blew her stuff up. Now she's fixing to become Ziegler Legacy certified and uh, go after uh, the youth generation. So just really cool stuff. So we're there. All these crazy cool God moments are there. Um, I'll tell you two more things that just really blessed me. So it's all, the event's all over with. It's the very last day. Everybody went home on Sunday. I stayed one more day. I go to the beach because I was wanting God to just talk to me. I wanted to relive all the God moments that week. So I'm there on the beach, and I'm like asking God to speak. Like, I want you to show up. I want you to tell me something because this was different to me. It was almost like being a mercenary and getting dropped off on a mission. You know what I mean? Like you have some very specific instructions. Boom, go do it. I've been to church event after church event after church event, two-day retreat, three-day retreat, four-day retreat. I've never had as many God moments as I have in my life on this non-faith-based trip as I have at any other Christian convention I've ever been to in my life. More God moments on this four-day deal to go and learn about the do's and don'ts of writing a book. I knew something had just happened in these four days that was crazy because these people, are they're going all over the world. When we left there, we got a lady that's going back to South Africa and one going to Australia and one going to Britain and New York and Chicago and... So our little circle of friends that I got to influence for four days are going to the majority of the country, uh, other continents whenever we left there. Do you think it was cool that you got to drop just a little bit of Jesus on these people to take back home? Yeah, it's cool. So I'm sitting there. I'm sitting there at the beach by myself looking out there waiting for God to speak. You ever been in a place where you know God's fixing to speak? Like you feel it coming? Anybody ever heard God speak? Hey, there we go. And I ain't talking about the loud, audible stuff. Just you know he's fixing to tell you something, teach you something, whatever. You can feel it coming. I'm on the beach. I feel it coming. I feel it coming so strong I start looking for it. And the only thing I see is like a seagull running by. So I'm watching this seagull like waiting on it to say something. <laughs> and it don't say nothing. So then I look for something else. Like I'm looking for him to speak literally. I'm trying to make it happen. And it don't happen. So finally I give up and I'm like, I'm going to quit thinking for you. Let me just chill. So as soon as I chill, I take a look up out in the ocean. And I'm talking about... Uh, if those of you that are on my Facebook, you saw this. It was really impacting me. Way, way out there, I could see this itty-bitty sailboat. The thing could have been eight or 900 feet long, as far out as it was. But to me, a little bitty sailboat. You barely make it out. And I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at it, and I'm waiting. I know God's fixing to speak. I could just feel it. So I'm sitting there, and my first thought was, oh, my gosh, that sailboat is like, like you can't see the, even the edges of the water. There's water everywhere. Everywhere. I mean, as far as the eye can see, water. And I was like, man, if that water ever shifted or changed or did something funny, that water could absolutely destroy that boat. Like that, like nothing. And it's kind of like God said, yeah. But it's a sailboat, the wind could do the same thing. I said, okay. So if the wind changes, if it shifts, if it gets stronger, if a gust comes that the captain's not ready for, that wind could absolutely destroy this boat. Okay, that wasn't real profound. You can do better than that. So I'm just quiet for a second, and then it just hits me, man. Just real, like God is, man. He's real calm, real peaceful, real. Here's what you're missing, dummy. (laughs) 
the stuff that should and could absolutely destroy that boat. That boat uses for the tools to get it where it's trying to go. And man, it hit me so hard on that beach, I just dropped my head and I was like, man, God, thank you. Y'all know my story. Y'all have your own story. But Satan has sent stuff after you your whole life that should have destroyed you, could have destroyed you, will if you let it. But God can take all that stuff that was meant to destroy you and could destroy you and turn it around and use that as the tools to get you where he wants you to go. Guilt and shame about prison for a long time, that's hard to come out of until you learn some truth about God. He knew all that was going to happen and he saw enough potential to create you anyway. So how long are you going to wallow in guilt and shame and disappointment? And when are you going to let God turn that around and start using that for tools? Now the same thing that I was ashamed of and scared to death of coming home from prison and even talking about, I didn't want you to know that. How do I even have that conversation? Hey, Howard, it's nice to meet you. My name's Jason. I did 11 years in prison for murder. What's your name? And then the other thing that could happen is we come up, we meet, you know me for a long time, and then I tell you, hey, there's something I need to tell you. I couldn't tell you in the beginning because I didn't want to scare you off. Then they're mad because you didn't tell them. So I'm in prison like, how do I even talk to people? When they start asking, where you been? Where are you from? You had not had a job in 11 years? Bum, what have you been doing? The same thing that I was so scared to speak about, so scared to talk about. Guilt, shame, beat me up, beat me up, beat me up. Not knowing the whole time that God, that's the exact stuff that God was going to use as tools to take me where he wants to take me. Churches, youth rallies, prisons, whatever it ends up being. God has given you the ministry of reconciliation. He started on the first day of the trip and he didn't stop till I got off the plane. I got back on the plane to come home and I got a window seat. I'm like, oh man, that's my gift. That's my reward, right? <laughs> For being a good Christian this week. I get to sit by the window. And nobody was sitting by me yet and I'm thinking, you know what, I'm really tired. Like I'm going to kind of catch a cat nap. As soon as I close my eyes, the guy's like, uh-uh. Remember? I'm picking your seats. Remember that conversation you had? So like, all right. So I'm like, okay, cool. I'll just put my earbuds in. I'll listen to some music for a little while before I we go. Put my music in. As soon as I put it in, God's like, turn it off. Sheesh, man. I felt like a teenager again. My parents hate me. <laughs> and then here comes this little young blonde headed girl and sits down. Real timid, real shy. And then another guy sits down. And I was like, oh crap. If I share my story with her, I'm going to scare her to death. All right, God, we got to minister to this one and just stay away from the prison stuff. So give me something different. Where are you from? Oh, crap. And y'all know how the story went. What saved me was, is right before I took off, she got on the plane and she had three hula hoops tied to her backpack which was a little different. So uh, she got me to the edge of sharing my story and why I was fixing to write a book and I was like, we need to detour because it's way too early on the flight for her to be scared. I would be uncomfortable knowing I scared her for three hours, you know what I mean? Can you move one of us? That's not going to happen. So uh, we're sitting there and I said, hey, what's up with the uh, hula hoops? You have hula hoops there? And she goes, yeah. And man, God, just, just ask a question, right? Here it comes. A year ago, I was in a really dark place. And I took my daughter to a carnival and I saw this lady hula hooping, you know, three or four hula hoops at a time. And she goes, I never thought about hula hooping, never desired to. I saw that and something just changed inside of me. Like it gave me some life, you know, some, I liked it. So I asked the lady, do you do lessons? She said, yes. And said, will you teach me? She goes, for over the last year, I've been learning this. And I like it. it it's fun to me. And so, you know, we kind of do it here and there for small events or birthday parties or whatever. And man, it just hits me like that. It just... <laughs> It just hits me. And I'm like, man, there's, there's something more. So I was like, is this something you just like to do? Or she goes, I said, so uh, hula hooping became therapy for you. She goes, yeah. And I said, but really it became passion. Like you found a passion. She goes, yeah. So what are you going to do with it? She goes, I'll just do it for me. I'm like, no, 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 no. There's people in churches all over the world gripping because they don't know their gifts, talents, and passion. You're lucky enough, blessed enough to know your passion. You got to do something with it. What are you going to do with it? I don't know. So by now, I'm all amped up. Like, I don't even care about scaring nobody. I'm like, I'm ready. Let's go. 
So if you ever thought about going to like a burn victims unit at a hospital where the kids are all burnt up and they're you know in bad shape, show up and do the hula hoop thing for them and encourage them, make them laugh and smile. Oh yeah, I could do that. I don't really know how to get started. And I was like, what about cancer patients, cancer wards? You could show up and just really light these kids up. I could probably do something like that. I just don't know how to get started. I said, have you ever heard of St. Jude's? She goes, yeah, I know St. Jude's Hospital. So there's thousands of kids there. Some are going to make it, some are not. There's volunteers from all over the world that go to that place and show up. It's really hard to get in there, but once you get in, I mean, you're around some of the most sweet kids that you're ever going to meet, and you may be the last thing to encourage them before they pass away. She goes, oh, yeah, I'd love to do something like that, but I don't have a clue how to do that. And I was like, well, I just happen to know the board of directors for St. Jude's Hospital. Imagine that. <laughs> Sitting beside each other on the plane. I was like, so if I start this email to my friend that's the board of directors for St. Jude's Hospital, I don't need your information, but would you just put your information in there and hit send? And when she calls, will you answer? Are you for real right now? I'm for real right now. But you have to put in your information and hit send. So she puts it in, she hits send. And we put it up. And I just, God, man, you better, please don't make that, make me look stupid. This lady better call, right? So, uh, so we talk for a little bit more. Then I find out that she's got a passion for any inner city kids nobody else wants to deal with. And I was like, you really need to get out and do that. You need to, there's not a lot of people that have a heart for that. You need to go out there. You need to put in. You got to. Uh, fill out the paperwork, interview, whatever you got to do. I'll think about it. I said, no, you got to do it. You don't understand. God don't waste my time. He put me beside, beside you for a reason. I said, so don't look at this weekend as me just showing up being a cool guy or whatever made you laugh, inspired you a little bit. You need, to, you need to realize that God showed up. God's with you on this plane. I'm not God, but God lives in me. He showed up to tell you that he knows where you're at. He knows your hurts. He knows your heart. He loves you. He has not forgotten you. You got to start living. I shared my story with her. She cried. You don't know how bad I needed that. I didn't know how bad you did, but God did. So I picked this seat. We uh, asked her if I could get a picture of it so I could post about it on Facebook. She said, yeah. So through Facebook the next day, what was it that happened first? Which one? Uh, my friend got a hold of her from St. Jude's. So they hooked up so she can do her hula hoop stuff for St. Jude's. I was like, ah, it's pretty awesome right there. God's pretty cool. So I just got a message a couple of days ago. No, no, no. It was probably four days after I'd been back saying, hey, just want you to know, thank you for that flight. I needed that. Guess who put in to be an inner city school teacher? I said, that's awesome, man. Let me know how it goes. And then it was either last night or the night before I got the message saying she got it. So the point in all this mess is not how cool I am or whatever. I'm just dumb enough to open my mouth and let God take it wherever he wants to. Did I have any idea about St. Jude's coming out of my mouth when I sit on that plane? No. Did I know some hula hoop girls fixing to sit with me? Have I ever dealt with hula hoop women before? <laughs> no. You know, you know what I'm saying? You just show up and you open your mouth and you let God take it wherever he wants to because he's given you the ministry of reconciliation. Can you just open up your mouth this week? When it's so easy to convince yourself, I'm just at Walmart, I just want to check out and go home. It's been a long day at work. Could you just try it for fun? And just speak up and see where God takes it? Anybody willing to do that? You have to believe that God's given you the, the ministry of reconciliation before you ever do it. Because I go into a lot of conversations unprepared. And I'm like, God, I always blame God. I'm like, this better be you, because I'm going to blame it on you. If it doesn't go the right way, I'm going to be like, God told me to say it. I really believe he's given me the ministry of reconciliation, so I don't mind speaking up. I'm still nervous. I'm still like, uh, I don't want to miss God. Uh, I almost talked myself out of sharing my story with this girl, because I decided she was scared before I gave her a chance to be scared. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm human, too. I almost talked myself out of blessing somebody for maybe the rest of their life if I never see her again. I almost talked myself out of her blessing. Not only that, but however many hundreds of thousands of kids she ends up doing that ministry for, the inner city kids she's fixing to be the Christian teacher for, I almost talked her out of that. Is it worth speaking up? Y'all stand up, let me pray for you. I love you guys, man. Thank y'all for always having us back out here. We love coming. Oh, we love coming. Love you guys, man. It's a blessing. It's a blessing.
Lord God, I just thank you for an opportunity to, uh, to speak and to share. And uh, we, we never end up going where I think you're going to go. And it's fun. I'm just along for the ride. But I pray that somebody was blessed, somebody was touched, somebody was inspired. More than anything, encouraged. I want to see Christians that won't pass the buck to somebody else. Let me put my wife on the phone. I don't want to speak up because I'm tired. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. I want to see Christians that are active and involved in their faith. And if they'll just get a taste of it, God, if you'll just help them, push them out there that those first few times so they get a taste of it where they're comfortable. They don't have to be a people person. They don't have to be loud and crazy or anything like that. It's simple conversation. Lord, you use everybody. You're not going to put the people you put in front of me in front of somebody else that's a little more shy or reserved. You're going to put people that are like that in front of them, somebody they're comfortable to minister to. But at some point, we have to decide that we're going to open our mouth and really, really believe that you've called us to have the ministry of reconciliation. God, you see enough in us to trust us with bringing the world back to you. And I pray that you would drop a little bit of that in our spirits, in our hearts, in our minds before we leave this church today. How much potential you see in us. If you would just give us a portion of that where we could believe enough in ourselves and believe, believe enough in you in us that we would open our mouth whenever we go somewhere, whenever we, we can feel that God moment potentially coming. So I thank you for this church. I thank you for all the people they've already touched, everybody they've already blessed in their life. And I thank you for the people they're going to bless today and this week and the rest of their lives. I thank you for every divine appointment that you ever send to anybody in this room and that nobody in this room would be, a, be afraid to speak up. And just give you an opportunity to change somebody's life. We're in the business of changing eternity. And I tell myself that about once a week because I can't wrap my mind around it. God's given us this ministry of reconciliation. Your job matters till the end of the day. Then the next day they're going to want to know what you can do for them then. And next week it doesn't matter what you busted your tail doing the week before. They want to know what can you do for me today. But when it comes to God and the ministry of reconciliation, you're changing eternity for the person you're talking to and eternity for all the people that they go to after they leave your presence. Take us everywhere we're going today safe, God. Get us back home safely and use us this week. We just want to be used this week for your kingdom. And we thank you for that awesome, awesome responsibility. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.